In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Let us open our heart and our mind to His grace, to the Holy Spirit. Let us entrust the Lord every burden, every worry, to put everything in His hands. And let us entrust ourselves to Him through Our Lady's hands, like little children. Give us, O Lord, graciously your Holy Spirit, give us your light, your discernment, incline our will toward yours, and we ask you this through the powerful intercession of Our Lady, who is always present among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Mary Eugene, pray for us. So, good evening again to everybody. Welcome. Welcome back, and some of you are maybe here for the first time, I don't know. Anyway, you're very welcome. Um, today we continue. This is our second meeting this year. Uh, we, we had one uh, last September, and today's one. Um, we continue our exploration, reading, and understanding of this uh, great work of Father uh, Marie Eugene. Uh, this is the first volume. It's called I Want to See God. Uh, the, th the second one is I Am the Daughter uh, of the Church. Um, of course, this is a translation from uh, the French. The French, as I said it before, is uh, today in one volume, but initially it was like the English in two volumes. Today we have in my eyes, it is a hard task because not only we have two chapters, but I still consider the first chapter that we will see, I will explain everything, don't worry, um, is still a difficult chapter uh, for me. Uh, it is very important. Um, so the, the two chapters we, were, we are meant to, to study, or um, I am meant to pr present to you, are uh, um, taken from the first part of the book. First part of the book. The book has, um, as far as I remember, five parts, great parts. And <coughs> they are taken from the first part. They are chapter three and nine. Uh, the choice was made by uh, Monique, but it is you can trust uh, Monique in these uh, matters. So, um, the first chapter, which is chapter 3, is about the knowledge of self. The knowledge of self. The first part of the book, from which we have these two chapters, is rather, you would, you would think, it's for beginners. But be very careful. This is very important to keep this in mind. Any chapter, says Father Marie-Jean in one of his notes, footnotes, he says any chapter could be placed in any place. Uh, I thought, he says, I thought that the most appropriate place is to put it here or there, but it doesn't mean that's, that this chapter is not useful in any other place. So please keep this 
uh, in mind. When he starts the first part, he lays the foundations. Some chapters are so important that you need to not only to keep them in mind, but to live them till the end. And one of them is today's chapter. This is why I consider that the task is daunting. Not because we can't understand, but because there are different elements. Uh, it is absolutely possible for me to rush everything and to give you just skimming a uh, few ideas and you go back home with these ideas. Uh, that's a choice. It's not my choice. It has never been my choice. It's not an intellectual endeavor uh, or undertaking. It's, it is, but also it is for our spiritual life. It is for our good. So I try when I, when I teach to uh, show and underline what is useful for us also on our journey, not just to have an intellectual approach of, of this great opus. Um, okay? This chapter, the chapter, uh, so I'm, yeah, we have the first chapter I'm supposed to, to present is Knowledge of Self, chapter three, and the second chapter, which is chapter uh, nine, I, I'm just using the photocopies, but it's, Everything is here. It's, these are the photocopies from here. So don't think that I have secret um, information that you don't have. I don't have that secret information. Well, I have it maybe through different means, but not 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 paper. Okay. Now the the second chapter is chapter nine, and it's about is about spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. So the different stages, uh, etc. Both chapters, as I would say, all the chapters of his book are fascinating. So I invite you to help me help you, okay? So um, first and foremost, chapter three, which is uh, the uh, knowledge of self. Um, my choice today is to give it all our attention. If we have some time left, I will move on to, this, to the other chapter. But don't worry, when he addresses the issue of knowing uh, oneself or knowing of, of self, he constantly, because he is a Carmelite, because he, uh, is, um, he has a deep knowledge of the doctors of the church, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, etc., etc., he constantly has in mind the issue of growth. You can never, and the, please remember this, he addresses it, he says it, but I put it now. You can never study a subject in one way only. Why? Because the needs at a certain, at the beginning, as a beginner in spiritual life, are of a certain form, of a certain contents. You never drop them, but you will have new needs. You will develop you will develop, you will be transformed, the grace of God will work, and then you will have new needs. So the same subject, subject of humility, subject of knowledge of self, any virtue that you would like to address is never the same at the beginning, the middle, way, it's a way to speak of course, the beginning, the middle, and in the end of the journey. You see, at uh, the beginning is more arduous, we are almost fighting with ourselves, we are trying to find the opposite of virtue to, our vi to the vices and sins, etc. So it's more arduous, we are a little bit left to our own strength. This is explained by Father Eugene, as it is explained by St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross. But then progressively, I'm almost giving you chapter, the other chapter, chapter 9. No? Uh, progressively, the work of God start to enter and take over a little bit. Not totally, because we, it's a collaboration, but his, his action at a certain point starts to be more, more powerful, more present. He will prevail in a way over our uh, action. He will lead, while in the beginning, a little bit, we are leading, you see? So, you cannot evaluate knowledge of self in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. And he will come to that toward the end of the chapter. 
but I want from the beginning to give you an idea of how to read the book, how to understand the, what is in the back of his mind constantly, what, he, what is in the back of the mind of St. Teresa of Avila, what is in the back of the mind of uh, St. John of the Cross, etc. Okay? Okay. <coughs> Having said that, now, <coughs> this first chapter, which is chapter 3, Knowledge of Self, has <coughs> two parts. The first part is the object of the knowledge of self, and then the second part, looks more juicy, I would say, is how to acquire knowledge of self. But in the first part, he also gives us many tips on how to acquire knowledge of self. So it's, um, it's always also present uh, from the beginning. Now, <coughs> the be in the, from the beginning of the chapter, he has just here a quote from Teresa of Avila, and he will continue to quote that same quote at least two or three times in the, in the chapter itself. So let me read this first quote from Teresa of Avila. Remember that Father Mario Jean's choice is to follow Teresa of Avila's interior castle. And whatever is lacking there, he will add it from other books, from her, and from John of the Cross, of course, in certain moments, he's, he's absolutely needed. And the best verification of everything is St. Therese of the Child Jesus. So the, the, the ch he checks everything in his mind, in the back of his mind, with Therese. Does it work? Would it work with Therese? Okay, then I can say it. You see? Um, I um, invite you to watch the first video, not September 1, but June 1, which is not included there. You can go back to uh, uh, June 1, uh, to, because I explained a little bit how uh, he works. I, I won't repeat myself all the time. So. Um, if you don't know how to reach it, just ask me after the, the talk, I can explain where to find, why to find it. And in case you are watching the recording, you will have the indication, um, it's, it's part of a playlist. So it, you will find the first talk um, uh, in the beginning, okay? Uh, in June one. And also the other series I gave before, uh, an entire day on, on the Father Marie Now, the, here's a quote. This is a quote from Teresa of Avila, from a book of her life. Self-knowledge with regard to sin is the bread which must be eaten with food of every kind, however dainty it may be. What does it mean? Self-knowledge is the bread in, in his mind. You eat a sandwich, but you change. Sometimes it's cheese, sometimes it's ham, sometimes it's eggs. I don't know, whatever you are eating, no uh, tuna, mayonnaise, whatever. Mm? But the bread is the base. Or if you have a lunch or whatever, in certain traditions, bread is there constantly on the table. Uh, you can't just eat without bread. Bread is, is fundamental for certain traditions, uh, culinary traditions. So when Teresa of Avila says that you can change your food, but the bread is always there in her mind. No, she doesn't have to repeat it, no? The bread, the constant bread present there in, in the entire graces and journey that we will uh, undergo is knowledge of, of self. Which means what? You cannot abandon at any stage knowledge of self. You can reach the highest points of spiritual life you cannot drop knowledge of self. It will develop, of course. We will talk about that. It will change. God will, will enter deeply and work. He, it, the end of the chapter is, is marvelous. I think it needs to be uh, meditated a lot. And I'm alluding to, just for you to know, because otherwise you say, well, what is, what is, what is he alluding to? Uh, how to acquire uh, the uh, knowledge of, of self. Yeah, it's in, in this um, uh, explanation, he, he shows uh, how God, in fact, is the one who realizes uh, the change and offers a certain knowledge of self. Knowledge of himself, God, and knowledge of self for, for us. He is the one who, who gives us this, okay? So, this quote, this advice from Teresa of Avila, 
is understood and lived deeply by Father Mariogé. It's not something for beginners only, it is something for everybody. Wherever you are on the journey, wherever you are, wherever you think <laughs> you are, you still need uh, knowledge of self. Now, he divides the chapter, as I said, in two parts, object of the knowledge and the how to acquire it. And let us start with the object of the knowledge of self. He divides this part A in two sub-parts. And this is very interesting, very interesting. The first part is, he names it, is a psychological knowledge, a knowledge of psychology. But be careful, listen first to Father Merogen. Don't project your own thoughts and, uh, I don't know, whatever is in your mind about psychology. Just listen to Father Merogen first. So the first part is about um, a, a psychological knowledge and, and the second part is a spiritual, a spiritual knowledge. Both are important. Different levels, different types of working of the grace of God, but both are important. So let us see first how Father Marie Eugène addresses the um, psychological uh, knowledge. In the, his text, he says the following. He quotes an author saying that St. Teresa, I'm here on page 35, St. Teresa had advanced the science of psychology more than any philosopher. Of course, it's a quote from the 18th century, but still, of course, we are still very far from uh, all, all, all what we know today about psychology, like uh, Freud, Jung, uh, you name it. Hmm? Now, uh, just uh, uh, an observation before we continue. You might think that this is all what he will say about psychology. You might think that this is our psychology here. No, he will address the issue of psychology in other places in his work. So don't ever think that this is all what he knows about psychology or he wants to show about psychology. That's not at all the case. He will address that, especially in the deep purifications. There is an entire part just dedicated on the interactions between uh, the deep purification that God uh, realizes in us and uh, psychological problems. Remember also that Father Mario Eugène belongs to last century, and in last century, um, psychology blossomed uh, a lot, and he took part to very important seminars in the north of France, organized by Father uh, Bruno uh, de Jesus Marie, Carmelite, where uh, the best of the best in all different areas were invited to intervene. So he was au fait with all uh, the knowledge of psychology uh, of his time, and it, it wasn't a uh, little. So please be careful when you read that part of psychology. Don't ever think, oh, well, this is very poor. This could be the reaction. No, it's not the case. Now, he points out to three elements. He could have an entire book on that. but. You know, you, you have to balance all the topics that you are offering and uh, not ex exceed uh, in a way or another. The three points are the following. Today, maybe, we would give another title to, to this sub-part, no? Uh, his title, actual title, is Psychological Knowledge. We could put today Anthropology, or to be more precise, Supernatural Anthropology. Uh, you have even universities uh, who have the, you can, they can offer you a master in and, and a PhD in that. Uh, the Theresianum, for instance, has a section called uh, Christian Anthropology. So it's not philosophical anthropology. Anthropology comes from anthropos, so it's the knowledge about the human being. But you can have a knowledge of the human being from a mere philosophical 
point of view, which is using only the light of our mind, the natural light of our mind. But you can also have an understanding of the human being, a supernatural anthropology, a Christian anthropology, by seeing how Christianity understood the human being. There are added elements. Uh, one of them, for instance, is the spirit, uh, which is the deepest part of the soul. Uh, it's not mentioned by uh, philosophers or uh, psychoanalysts or, or psychology, because you can't reach it, you can't reach that area. There is a subtle hint, of course, constant hint in the work of Jung, but I don't want to, to, to divert from uh, Father Marijin, but I'm just giving you the information, okay? So today you might give it as a title, a different title to this uh, chapter, for you to understand what are we dealing with. We are dealing with anthropology, but supernatural anthropology. Anthropology, or theological anthropology, if you prefer, which takes in consideration the philosophical one, but adds elements that you cannot have without the light of faith. Okay, got a point? Now, the three points are the following. And I'm sure he can write a book on that, but he chose to, to address three points only. The first one is how Therese of Avila underlined the fact that knowing the soul, knowing herself, knowing the faculties, her own faculties, was very important. I won't go through all the quotes from Teresa Avila or from Father Mary Jean, but I'm trying to give you the contents and explain it. Teresa Avila says, it's not because we have a body that we can, with, with, through, through the body we can see and sense everything, that we don't have something else called, called the soul. The soul is very important and it's not because we don't see, I'm almost quoting Teresa Avila, hmm? it's not because we don't see the soul that the soul doesn't exist. And then she goes further in other places, quoted by Father Marijin in this chapter, where she says that it's when she discovered the differences between certain faculties that that freed her in her spiritual life. So you see how a minimum of anthropological knowledge or knowledge in anthropology is important. Personally, when I, when I teach spiritual life, there is always a moment where I will present, I would say, the most accepted vision of the human being according to uh, Catholic uh, theology and will show there is a body, there is a soul, and within the soul you have the different faculties, the, the, uh, the, the, the reason, uh, the, the higher part, the rational part of the soul, which has the mind, the will, uh, the memory, then you go a little bit uh, out, uh, it's still in the soul, you have the imagination, the inner senses. I'm, I'm, I'm here following John of the Cross, by the way. And then you go to the body and you have all the, the, the senses, etc. But deep beyond the soul, you have the spirit. Father Mirajin addresses all that. But I'm just showing you that it's important to understand who we are, a minimum of knowledge. You will not have a degree in psychology. You will not have a degree in theological anthropology. But in order to manage your own spiritual life, it's important. So Father Marajan underlines this importance in trees of Avila. In trees of Avila. And he quotes her saying that it freed her. And the example he takes is when she discovers, and this is, you can read, you have to read the chapter. Huh? I'm just uh, uh, alluring you or uh, uh, giving you a bait so you, you would hopefully before sleeping, you know, to read at least a few, few pages, no? Um, uh, Teresa of Avila says at a certain point that she discovers that there is a difference between the mind, the intellect, thinking, and imagination. She thought they were one. You say, well, this is obvious. I will show you that it's not obvious. And I'm still functioning with Father Mary Eugene. I'm the same example, which is number one. <coughs> when we pray, don't we have distractions? This is the most common thing. If, if we think that praying means uh, we shouldn't have uh, absence of, of distractions, we fall into the 
difficulty that Therese, had, Therese of Avila had for, for, for many years, because she didn't know the difference between imagination, an outer area in us, and an inner area, which is the intellect, or if you want, the highest part of the soul and the spirit. So when we pray, which part of us is united to God? It's the deepest part. So the, and sometimes God leaves the outer part free. So what happens? You can have passive distractions, and passive distractions become active distractions. Okay? I'm just breaking it to you. Eh? You see? So she discovers that, that there is a difference between the mind, which could be taken by God, the highest part of the soul if you prefer, and the imagination. She says, I never spent uh, an hour without hearing noises and, and, and having headaches. This is Teresa of Avila. That's very consoling, no? She had to pray with constant headache, probably my type of migraine, because of uh, some uh, psychologists said because she had a very strong will, but sometimes when you have a, a strong will and, and things that are happening in your life that you don't like, you feel the conflict between your, the power of your will and the events of your life, so this can create a, a, a headache, a real headache, not a... Not a you see what I'm trying to say. So some say that it could be the cause because she had a very strong will, Teresa of Avila, no? Despite all what she says about herself, that, that she, she has that, okay? So you see, this is a simple example. Distinguishing between imagination and um, in intellect. This is just an example. Hmm? Now, the second example, and the second point uh, Father Mirajen is taking is what? Is the difference between the exterior part of our being and the interior part of a being. It's more or less close to the first example, I would say. I would find it. No? But still, the division between, if you prefer, the lower part of our being, often being slave to that part, and the upper part of our being who is, is, is not following. Like what St. Paul says. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not doing it. So there is a, a heavy part in me, lower, heavier part in me, that, that is dragging me in a certain direction while the other part, no. And Father Maria Eugene says, this is not only present in Teresa of Avila. He says, all the mystics talk about this, including, and first and foremost, the gospel itself, the sense and the spirit, no? being led by the, the, the um, flesh, as St. John puts it, or St. Paul, and, or being led by, by the spirit, St. Paul and St. John. Okay? So you see the division. There is a division. The exterior, exterior part and the interior part. That's very important. St. Augustine will, uh, will come back to, to, to this uh, uh, distinction. It's very important for him, no? To go inside or to stay outside where darkness is, if you want. No? Okay? So it's important to, dis to, to know that. Uh, we are dealing with two worlds. The world we see, the world we are dealing with, is only one of the two worlds. There is another world, which is an inner world. Teresa of Avila explored that and mapped that world. This is me talking, not Father Marajin, but I'm sure he would, he would uh, agree uh, by, with that. Okay? You see what I'm trying to say? So that's important to understand that it's not only the world I, I see and I feel and I'm dealing with. There is another world. It could seem maybe obvious to you, but still it's important. The third point is, a very, is, is more subtle. <coughs> it's the difference between the soul and the spirit. I don't want to dive too much into that. He, and even Father Marajin doesn't dive too much. He just gives a quote and leaves it there. But there is a difference between the soul and the spirit. The spirit is the, 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 the deepest part of the soul. But still the spirit is different from the soul. Uh, you can read the seven mentions of Teresa of Avila. This is not the quote that Father Marajin is giving. He is giving it from a different place. But you can read the seven mentions of Teresa of Avila, where she's, 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 she's talking to us or to her daughters where, who are supposed to read the book, and she says, you might think there is no difference, but I can assure you there is. It's very subtle, but there is. And it's fundamental. Because if you, if you don't take into consideration the existence of the spirit, the spirit is not the mind, the spirit is the, the closest part to God himself. It's, the, the area in our being that enters in direct contact with God himself, okay? 
uh, I won't give you a course on, on the spirit and the soul, but I'm just uh, ex giving you uh, a minimum of, of, of uh, knowledge about it. Okay, so if you don't have the spirit, well, which means when you pray, when you receive communion, etc., nothing is happening. Why? Because what you feel, what you sense, you you think that this is this is all of it. While in fact, when you pray, it, there is a, a, a hidden part, a deepest part in us. By the way, it's the first reading uh, of today's mass. I don't know if you noticed it. No, the spirit is in our heart, prays in our heart with uh, how you say it in English with. Uh, because I, I, I read in French my, my Bible, so uh, how do you say it in English? In un, the spirit with uh, unaudible sighs or groans, groans, yeah, or sighs or whatever, yeah. Uh, it, it prays in us. This is Roman uh, chap chapter eight, uh, Saint Paul. Okay, so it means what? Well, there is a deep part in us that we our consciousness doesn't reach it. But if you cancel that part. There is no spiritual life, because this is the part that enters in direct contact with God. So this distinction between spirit and, and soul is important. Okay? Now, so this means that there is a minimum. I'm, I, can, I wrap this first part uh, of the um, psychological knowledge by saying that... <coughs> There is a minimum to know about ourselves, and it's part of the knowledge of self to understand how we are built, uh, what are our faculties, uh, how do they work, uh, etc. Okay? Now, we move on to the second sub part, which is uh, number two, A2. Uh, we, we are doing A1, now it's A2. Mm. The spiritual knowledge. The spiritual knowledge. Hmm. This is more juicy, I would say, the spiritual knowledge. One of the, I would say the best part, probably, of, of the story with the end, the last part. <coughs> what matters in self-knowledge is who we are in the eyes of God. What matters in self-knowledge is who we are in the eyes of God. The title of this part is Spiritual Knowledge. What does it imply? It implies the action of the Holy Spirit or the grace of God in us. And what this action reveals to us about ourselves and about God. So. We can talk forever about spiritual self-knowledge, but if we don't have the experience, we will, we will be very frustrated, no? So it is important to understand that when we receive God's graces, there is a double revelation. A revelation of who we are in the eyes of God. And who God is. Who we are in the eyes of God. And who God is. Now, here the uh, Father Mario Jean's uh, words could seem a bit tough. Because he seems to sort of squash us a bit too much by talking about our nothingness and the infinite and limitations and the infinite being of God. Bear with him what he says is the truth. It comes not from his mind only, it comes from his experience. So trust the witness of God, trust the man who prayed hours and hours thousands of hours in his life and dealt with God and was, had that, that experience. So when you read this passage, you will feel sometimes that he's a bit pushing it too much. It's like we are nothing, nothing, and God is everything, God is infinite, etc. You will say, well, ah, we still are something, no? We can't say that we are nothing. 
you are squashing us too much. Where are we going here? Uh, just bear with him, bear with him, because this is the result of a growing experience. And here, the, the idea of growth, the, the factor or parameter of growth, keep it in your mind. Because the more we grow, the more this perception is growing. To the point that he will even say, this is how you discern real growth from, from or a real grace from uh, no grace. Uh, if our spiritual ego, this, he doesn't say that, but it's implied, no? If our spiritual ego becomes inflated, the more we grow, uh, be careful. Yes. Think about it twice, because um, it is a temptation and we all fall in, in this temptation. Don't, don't uh, also think that it's uh, something alien. It's common, very common. It's normal because in the beginning it's the old man in us who is following Jesus, who is receiving the graces. So instead of reacting with the new man, with the theological virtues, faith, uh, supernatural faith, hope and, and, and love, we are reacting with rather uh, the old man in us, which is the feelings, the emotions, the senses, uh, what suits us, etc. No, our taste of things, etc. You see? So, it's common also, but that's a sign to discern here, hmm? how to acquire or how it works. Having a, a fervent prayer, he doesn't say it, but it's implied, having a fervent regular prayer allows God to pour his graces in us. And as a result, this offers us this double knowledge. Who am I in the eyes of God and who is God? And the abyss, he uses this word many times, the abyss between these two our nothingness and God's being, no? And he has tough quotes. I won't quote them right now, but you can read the, the chapter, okay? Do we just have to remember the Magnificat? Uh, if, if, you, if you think that that's the solution, uh, of course, yeah, we, we should remember the, the Magnificat, of course, the humility uh, of, of Our Lady, uh, of Our Lady, absolutely, absolutely. Um, <coughs> So, what he's trying to show us is the, the result, the fruits of the spiritual experience, what they realize, what it realizes, sorry, in us. Uh, remember St. Augustine when he says, uh, he talks about our uh, misery, no? our nothingness, and the mercy of God, but in Latin both words are, have the same root, hmm? misericordia and the, our mi mis mi misery. misery, you see? But he says both meet perfectly. I would add, this is me, not Father Mario Jean. The, the growing experience of God, I'm going in his direction, but I'm not, not going astray. The growing experience of God shows us our nothingness, but also shows us his mercy. Father Marie-Eugène will repeat constantly, God gave me the experience of the power of his mercy. Power of his mercy. He says, Saint Therese of the child Jesus, God gave her the, the gentleness, the sweetness of, uh, the experience of the sweetness of his mercy. He gave me the power, the strength, the fortitude of, of the experience of his mercy. Just keep this in mind. No? So we are dealing with somebody who certainly experienced his own nothingness, it, it transpires in the text, it's very visible, but also had an amazing experience, growing experience of the mercy of God. Can we bear, this is me talking, not him, can we bear the vision of our nothingness if it's not supported by the vision of God's mercy? Can we bear the vision of our nothingness if this vision is not supported by the experience of God's mercy? You see what I'm trying to say? So they go together. And this is always me talking, not him, but the more we grow, the more this experience grows. So we are not going to different heights. These are our heights, the experience of our nothingness and the amazing, um, mind-blowing experience of uh, God's mercy.
Now, he moves on from this, um, the fruit of the action of the Holy Spirit in us, showing us the abyss between uh, us and God, our finite being, uh, our nothingness and God's uh, infinite, to the second, the following point, <coughs> which would seem very contradictory if seen from far. He will talk about the supernatural riches, the supernatural riches. We are still talking about knowledge of self. But in the knowledge of self, what happens? God pours his graces and talents and spiritual talents, whatever, in us. So that's part of the spiritual knowledge, the, uh, uh, the uh, no, uh, spiritual knowledge of self. It's important, not in the name of humility, it's important not in, not in the name of humility to reject God's graces. Oh no, I'm not worthy of, because he's showing me my nothingness, it doesn't mean that he doesn't want to give me graces. So it could look paradoxical, it could look like he's contradicting himself, he's not. And this you will find it constantly in his work, even chapter 9. You will read the chapter 9, he will talk about certain things and then a few paragraphs after he seems to say the opposite. No, this is spiritual life. You have to take <coughs> both aspects together. Like for instance when you talk about the Holy Spirit, we say that the Holy Spirit's action is, uh, I say it in Latin first and then in, in, uh, in, in English, suaviter et fortiter. Suaviter et fortiter, which means gentle, sweet, the action of the Holy Spirit. It's all together gentle and sweet and powerful. If it's only powerful, if God is only tough with you, is it really God? If God is only sweet with you, could be, but be careful. Be careful, please. <laughs> so you find that it's constantly a mix between these two aspects. And when you read Father Mario Eugène, you will constantly find these two aspects of the mystery. The mystery of growth, this is chapter 9. The mystery of knowledge of self. The mystery of the spiritual action of God. He reveals our nothingness, but in the same time, he fills us with graces. It's like... Contradictory, it's not. So bear with any writer, any serious writer, uh, in spiritual life, because you'll have the impression sometimes that he's, he or she is contradicting himself, but it's not the case. It, that's spiritual life. The, the mystery is to accept both aspects together. So, when he will address the supernatural richnesses, uh, he will underline the fact that he doesn't actually use the word, but I will use it because it's uh, so common. We have to be magnanimous. Magnanimous. Which mean, what is mag? How do you say it in English? Mag 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 no, uh, magnanimity. Mag magnanimity. Magnanimity. Yes, magnanimity. The word comes from Latin magna, which means big, anima, which means the soul. So you have to have a soul that accepts great things. We are made for great things and there is no contradiction or opposition between being made for great things and in the same and <coughs> therefore uh, a call to receive many graces and in the same time um, discovering our nothingness or uh, etc. So knowing oneself is also going with true humi humility and not false humility. And Father Mario Eugène will quote Teresa of Avila talking about false humility. We should stop, she says, um, paying attention to these, this false humility where people in the name of humility will say, no, 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 I don't want to uh, receive uh, graces uh, from God, that I'm not worthy, etc. No, it doesn't work like that. That's wrong. That's false humility. Can you give an example of how 
someone might <coughs> fall into that trap? Um, a typical person's not going to say, oh, I don't want to receive a grace from God. But how does how's that lived out as a trap that someone might fall into? The, the, first, to think, it, I think first it's, it's like a... Um, like, um, um, we think, the, 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 first, the error first is in the mind, in the conviction. I'm convinced that receiving a great, th I'm not made for great things, uh, I'm just a little person. Uh, so you are making yourself too little to the point that you are blocking God's graces. So first it's in the mind, it's, it's a conviction. Uh, it's a personal uh, understanding of th uh, thinking that this is the truth, but it's a it's not the truth. It's it's it's, a f it's false. Hmm? So you say no, I'm not made for great things. I'm a little person. I I know nothing. I'm this. I'm that, etc. So well, you are blocking God from acting in you because we are all called for great things. We are all invited to receive God Himself to participate in into His own life to receive plenty of graces. You see. So, uh, she talks about this, Teresa of Avila, because, remember, I give you the context of Teresa of Avila, of the court, because it's, it's not, he, he doesn't say it or, all that. <coughs> Teresa of Avila is explaining the supernatural action of God in mental prayer, in the prayer of the heart. So, she says that at a certain point, God starts to pour his graces uh, in us, in, into, into our uh, soul. And she adds and says, there are some, so she's talking about consecrated people also, not only lay, lay people, but essentially consecrated people. She says there are, there are people who think that they are so little and therefore they are not supposed to receive all these graces. So when they hear people talking about contemplation or mystical life, they say, oh, no, 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 that's not for me. Which is actually very common, more common than you can think. Uh, because it is a little bit pushing you out of your comfort zone. When God starts to enter and act in your life, it pushes you out of your comfort zone. So you reach a point where you say, no, no, that's not for me. <laughs> Why would I go there? No, that's totally new. I don't want new things. I'm happy with uh, uh, the way I am. You see what I'm trying to say? So all these mechanisms, she says, no, 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 no. Let us stop all this uh, rubbish and focus on true humility. And she says also, another temptation is the devil himself considers the person or, or mm, tempts the person by saying, no, you are too little, you are not made for these things. So how it comes? It comes from a conviction, but it also comes from a devil. You have the quote also in the chapter. No? So the devil can convince you that, no, how dare you think that you could re receive uh, uh, such graces, I don't know, like uh, Teresa of Avila or St. Therese or, or whoever. I think of St. Therese is better because Teresa of Avila had things that not all of us are called to, to have, but what Therese of the Child Jesus had, we, we all of us ha are called to have. So that's uh, an important criteria of uh, discernment. You see, you see what I'm trying to say? Okay? Of what? A graces of God example? When you receive communion, isn't it a grace? You receive Jesus himself. But with communion sometimes you can have, a, it's not always the case, but you might some, uh, ha sometimes have um, an experience feeling or emotional uh, uh, experience of the grace of God. It's not the grace, but it's come, it could come with it. Okay, you see what I'm trying to say? So, experience, the, the graces we receive is to listen to the word of God, putting into practice. The grace we receive is to receive Jesus himself in, in, in the Eucharist. And what comes with it, remember uh, how many times the Bible underlines God's love for us. But love for us humans is not only a concept, it's not only acts, but it's also sometimes a feeling. So it's, it could come also, I'm not saying the graces are feelings, not at all, but you could have that. And what we want to reach is the union with Christ. 
So all the graces that we are supposed to receive are supposed to transform us, purify us, free us from our sins, fill us with new virtues, closeness to, to, to Jesus, living more in his presence and in his love, which is even better. So all this is constant help received by the Holy Spirit that gives us light, um, understanding, discernment, an action to put into, to do the God's will. So all these are graces to be received because we don't go to God with our own strength. We can't go to God with our strength. We are supposed to do certain things, but after that, we can't fly. So we need the grace of God. We need the Holy Spirit. Without Holy Spirit, there is no spiritual life. So we need the action of the Holy Spirit in order to change. The, 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 what is at stake is transformation. Father Mérogine mentions it in chapter 9. No? Teresa of Avila talks about a transformation, and she takes the example of the... Uh, how do you call it in English? The worm that... Uh, silk worm that becomes a, a, like a butterfly. Hmm? So it's a, it's a total transformation. What is a worm and what is a, a butterfly? There's no comparison. So this is a, a beautiful example taken from nature to say something about what we are called to become. But how does this work? It's by receiving grace upon grace, as St. John says in the end of his prologue. I don't know if I answered that. Yes, yes. But well, don't you think? Well, yeah. Uh, yes. Our comfort zone is the old self. Our comfort zone even is our understanding of our faith and the way we live it. But this is still a comfort zone compared to where we are supposed to, to, to go. So, uh, whenever you open the word of God, does it push you out of your comfort zone? Otherwise, it's not the word of God. It's your own word or uh, whoever who else. Uh, well, so I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about uh, uh, in general, no? So, um, what is to be pushed out of our comfort zone? What is to receive these graces? Uh, take a simple example, listening to the word of God. It's, it's something that doesn't leave you in peace. No? Because it's, it's sort of pushing you, as you say, out of what uh, you, you are happy to, to continue to, to be doing, your own habits, etc. Uh, so, uh, do we really believe in transformation? Do we really believe in change? Well, this is what the grace of God wants. Uh, when we open the, the, the word of God, do we really expect change? Do we really expect to be nicely and uh, uh, um, challenged by, the, by Jesus' word? You see, that, that's, that's the, the, the thing. We can talk for hours about that. Now, so, we were talking about magnanimity. Uh, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, that's, that's very important to avoid that false humility uh, and open ourselves and accept. Therese of the child Jesus, she says that she was walking with her father, she was young, and looked to the uh, sky and saw a tea uh, made of uh, stars. And she said, oh, my name is in, the, in, is in heaven and I'm called to be a great saint. She was convinced about that. Are you convinced about that? <laughs> That's magnanimity. Are you convinced to be a great saint? To become, sorry, a big saint? Or maybe you are already, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but are you open to that? That's the idea. And it's not in contradiction with humility. This is true humility. Are we here today open to great things? Are we here open to union with God and beyond? That's, that's, the, that's the challenging, that's the magnanimity. Are you open for greatness? The greatness that God wants to realize in our life, not other greatnesses, by the way. Eh? You see what I'm trying to say? What, what he is trying to say. Now, so let us stop there. Now, the following point, which is to uh, C, uh, Father Marjorie will talk about the evil tendencies. It's a horrible part. You can read it also. 
it's not forbidden. And this is where he will talk about all our sins and vices and all the obstacles that we put to the uh, uh, grace of, of, of God. Um, it's part of knowledge of self. Old man versus new man. Knowledge of self. Who is acting here in me when I'm doing this, when I'm doing that? Is it the new man or the old man? Am I activating the theological virtues or am I activating the lower part of myself? Knowledge of self. No, knowing all the forces in us. Concupiscence, this tendency left in us after baptism that draws us towards sin but is not sin. Very important to know the difference. He doesn't spend uh, pages on it, but I'm just mentioning it. Concupiscence is very important. That's the, the tragic destiny of Luther, no? Is uh, to mix concupiscence and sin. This destroys you. It destroys you completely. If you think that your inclination towards sin is a sin, then that's the end. There is no hope for you. Do you follow me? I'll give you a simple example. It's not in the book, of course. If you are, going, if you are passing beside, uh, in front of a patisserie, and in London, God knows, we have these <laughs> patisseries, and you watch these uh, beautiful pastries there waiting for you, opening their arms and saying, here I am. What happens to you? Let us knowledge of self. What happens? This is not in the book, but I'm trying to help you understand what is concupiscence. What do you feel? Hmm? If you are a, a... Well... You feel an attraction toward that pastry opera is, uh, is out, okay? This attraction is normal and it's not a sin. It is left, says the Council of Trent, for the spiritual warfare, for combat, receiving the grace of God. Le le lead us not into temptation, means give me the grace when the temptation happens to overcome it and become victorious. With your grace, not with my strength. This is why I pray humbly and I say, lead us, lead us not into temptation, which means, God, I am weak. I am I'm inclined, not tempted yet. I am inclined to this cho piece of chocolate. I haven't yet said yes or anything. I'm just seeing it. So I'm inclined. But God, please take uh, into consideration my weakness and help me to overcome that temptation or that inclination that could become a temptation then then could become, God forbid, an act, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Now, <coughs> This is concupiscence, no? So there are forces in us, and it's important to know ourselves and to know what is happening in us. That minimum of knowledge is important. One important uh, uh, point here he will underline is very interesting, and I received it not, f I received it even orally from one of the Carmelite fathers in France. Now they are all dead now, but is is um, is Father Bernard who said the same thing and he took it from Father Mario Eugène because he was a, a, a disciple of a Father Mario Eugène. Bernard Gabriel. Father Mario Eugène says, you, you certainly heard of the seven, seven deadly sins, which are in fact seven deadly tendencies first, but then if you surrender, they become a, a sin. And if you give it full power, then it's dangerous for us, no? Very dangerous for us, God forbid. These are like seven tendencies in us that summarize plenty of others, but you have like, these are the heads. This is why they are called capital. Capital sins, because they are capita. Capita means the head, but they have other ramifications underneath. So uh, you can read if you, if you like. Uh, uh, explanations of which sin comes under which sin. You can read Thomas Aquinas, he, he analyzes that, etc., and after him. Now, that's not the point. The point is what? Is to know ourselves. And, and Father Marjim says that there are some tendencies, take the seven sins, that are stronger than others. We are not 
having equal strength in the tendencies, like the seven are full power uh, in us. No. We have one or maybe two that are dominant, he uses the word, dominant. The rest are weaker. So it's important to know yourself, to know myself. I have this tendency, so I'm aware, I'm prudent. And it continues till the end. It continues till the end. Okay? Uh, remember St. Francis, he was beyond 40 years old and uh, his brothers were praising him at a certain point and he said, oh be careful, I can still have children. <laughs> so, so, this is uh, uh, evil, the evil tendencies. Now we move on to how to acquire knowledge of self, which is part B. Um, it's a little bit what uh, he says also in, in the beginning. It's God's action that reveals us to ourselves. It's God's action that reveals us to ourselves. Give me a second, please, because I have a point. Yeah. When we do the examination of conscience, he doesn't talk about that, but it's there between the lines in all what he says. When we do the examination of conscience, we can do it in two different levels. The first level is I look with introspection to my conscience. I go back with my memory to what I have done. You no, know, when you do, you prepare yourself for confession, for instance, or before sleeping, you do an examination of conscience, or before mass, in the beginning of mass, we do an examination of conscience. There are various opportunities to do an examination of conscience, and it's very important because it keeps us alive, it keeps us aware, keeps us, uh, keeps our conscience uh, very uh, alive and, and and sensitive to the action of the grace of God. So introspection, analysis, and coming back to, to our memory and what we, we've done. That's the beginning of it. But be very careful. Be very careful. Because this is not enough at all. The examination of conscience needs the action of the Holy Spirit. I need to meet God during the examination of conscience because what I'm checking is sin is failures, is errors, is my actions, checking and I'm trying to understand my, my actions. Who will give me the correct understanding of my actions? Who will give me the correct appreciation of my sin? God himself. Because he is the offended, also, mainly. So it is important to invoke the Holy Spirit, the light and the help of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's, that's very important. It's not mentioned directly in the text, but it's, it's there, it's present. When we start the prayer of the heart, mental prayer, which we will do in, in few, within a few minutes, what do we do? We say, come Holy Spirit. Whenever we start to pray, we invoke the action, the, the immediate direct action, personal direct action of the Holy Spirit. So, in order to really know ourselves, the intellectual uh, knowledge is, is good, but it will never be enough. We need also that quote-unquote revelation that, uh, that, that the Holy Spirit operates or realizes uh, in us. Okay? Now, uh, an important point here, so this is God's action reveals, reveals us to ourselves and to him to ourselves. Now, there is a, a very interesting point here, and it seems to contradict the, the previous points, which is the excessive analysis our, of ourselves. It goes in the same direction of an examination of conscience where you are just with yourself. You can very much do an excellent introspection an excellent analysis, but that's not examination of conscience. That's not knowledge of self. You see? So he says that there are people who stay at that, who, doesn't allow, who don't allow the, the action of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, he goes even further. 
He says that there are even spiritual directors, I don't think it's that much spread today, but it could be, who keep the people they are helping or guiding into a constant self-analysis in order to know them themselves, like a constant examination of conscience, revising constantly themselves, and they keep them there. John of the Cross talks about it, Teresa of Avila talks about it, and Father Marijan is quoting them. Okay? So he says it's important to free the person. So he seems to contradict himself. It's like, well, I'm, am I not supposed to under know myself? Yes, remember magnanimity. So it's not only about me. And here he has a beautiful quote of Teresa of Avila where she says, stop all that, stop crucifying people, stop uh, enclosing them in this, in this prison and look at Christ. Gaze toward Christ, look at him, fix it, your, your, your gaze upon Christ, not upon yourself. That's beautiful and that's liberating mm -hmm. and it's important to read that part. <coughs> okay, I think I have to stop, otherwise uh, Monique will get upset and I can't bear that. So, um, so um, I haven't done chapter 9, but I've done it a little bit between the lines. I invite you really to read these uh, beautiful chapters, chapter 3 and 9 from the first part, and then until uh, next time. So, glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.